From the Auto Line Studios, here is your host, John McElroy. I want to thank you all for joining us on Auto Line this week, where the discussion is going to be all about the retail end of the automotive business. And that's because we've got the chairman of the National Automotive Dealers Association with us today. Bill Fox. And Bill, it's great to have you on AutoLine this week. John, thank you. It's great to be here. Also joining us today are Jeff Bennett from the Wall Street Journal and Steve Finley from Ward's Dealer Business. Always great to have the two of you here, too. Thanks, John. So, Bill, we should let the audience know uh, you've got a couple of dealerships in upstate New York. You handle so many brands, I've got to read the list because I can't memorize this. You've got Chevrolet, Chrysler, Dodge, Honda, Jeep, Ram, Scion, Subaru, and Toyota. Boy, that really covers the waterfront. And what I want to get you first talking about, though, is because you represent so many brands at, in dealerships, uh, I know that over-regulation, or what you call at least over-regulation of dealerships, is a concern. Explain what you mean by that and why it is a concern. Well, thank you. Uh, regulators uh, have, have imposed their will and wrapped red tape around the auto industry. And, and I think it's growing, John. I think there's more and more evidence of it every day. You'll see that if it's not the CFPB, it's the FTC, or it's, it's uh, now NHTSA with recalls. So I, I do believe that the regulators are more prominent and play a bigger role in, in managing and regulating dealerships. And small dealers, and we are small dealers, you know, 40% of all the dealers in this country sell less than 300 new cars a year. Now, we're not quite that small, but we're certainly on the small end of it. And, and they don't have the professional expertise to deal with that. So they rely even more today on their trade associations like NADA to, to be a voice for them on the Hill with the regulators in an attempt to bring reason to some of these regulations. Well, one of the big ones is the um, dealer reserve, which is the uh, practice of dealers adding a certain amount of percentage to the buy rate uh, that the lender is offering to finance the loan, which is, by the way, uh, the wholesale rate. It's not necessarily the, the rate to the consumer, so a lot of people get that mixed up. And one of the regulators, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, is suggesting flat fees as an alternative to the dealer reserve because they think that could lead to unintended ins discrimination or some other issues. Can deal and, and the NADA has been fighting that. Can dealers live with a flat fee? Well, I think the proper starting place, Steve, is let's talk about discrimination. There is no room for discrimination in any business, much in, including the car business. So all car dealers uh, resist and resent anybody implying that there's uh, discrimination in auto lending. And when, when we get to auto lending, it's a service that 80% of the buyers of new cars take advantage of financing those cars through their dealer. And there's good reasons for that, convenience and rate. And, I think that the proof is that auto dealers are able to lend money at less rate than banks and credit unions. It's proven. And, and the result is if the CFPB were to pay flats, there's a cost somebody will bear for that. And that cost will be borne by the consumer. Somebody is going to pay for increased rates. So I think the CFPB is misguided when it takes rates and says we're going to make everybody pay the same. They're doing a disservice to the very people they're trying to help. Those, some of those people are going to pay a higher fee and I think uh, the Wall Street Journal had an article recently that said over a four-year period some consumers will pay as much as six hundred dollars more for a loan if the, if the CFPB has their way. Why do you so, think they suppose flat fees and, are and, such a good idea? And, and just for those of us who don't know, what is the CFPB? The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Okay. And, and just by way of background, and I, I do know a little of this, you know, there are the only regulatory agency that gets direct funding from the White House, and they have no, no supervisory overview. Uh, so these guys are uh, running the show differently than other agencies of the government who are subject to review, who are subject to the budgetary process. So. CFPB is, is, a, 
is, I'm sorry, but it is, sure. it's a uh, creation out of the Dodd-Frank Act of 2010. So. Gotcha. Okay, so to Steve's question, why might consumers pay more if the CFPB has its way? Well, I think it's a real, uh, the real question is, I think the CFPB does not understand our industry. They don't understand, and in spite of all the efforts, and it's an uphill battle, and we, as Steve points out, we've been pushing this for two or three years that I know of, and they don't get the fact that auto dealers, you know, they started when they came out with their, with their first guidance. And, of course, they have no authority over auto dealers. Dodd-Frank excluded dealers from their purview. So they're trying to do indirectly what they can't do directly. They're trying to focus on the big lenders, the captive lenders, and say that they see a potential for uh, discrimination. They don't have the proof. They're... they're their statistics are wrong. They don't submit to any of the uh, uh, agencies or any of the, uh, even Congress. They've stonewalled Congress and they don't submit proof of how they arrive at the dis alleged discrimi discriminatory practices. So I think that, that the result is, uh, as we go forward, that the manufacturer, or the uh, auto dealers are proving day in and day out that we, there is a clear-cut value to the consumer. The consumer should be able to take advantage of the dealer franchise system and the fact that dealers discount f the, the rate and help them meet, you know, it's commonplace. It's one thing in my business to sell a car. It's another thing to deliver it. And it's a two-prong approach. We have to sell the car and then we have to help arrange financing. And day in, day out, as I said, 80% of the uh, buyers take advantage of the fact that we are able to get them the terms and the payment that they need for their budget. But I gotta believe there is some abuse out there, Bill, and how do you address that? Well, first of all, if there is abuse, and, and I don't know of abuse, but if there is abuse, we are subject to the FTC and the Department of Justice, and all those, all those uh, safeguards are in place. We certainly don't need the CFBB to come along and try to do indirectly what they can't do directly. Secondarily, I'll say to you, you know, uh, NADA, trying to be proactive, uh, saw a Department of Justice uh, um, program that was initiated in 2007 involved a case of it where a dealer had been charged with violating the fair credit credit guidance. NADA came up with a proposal, and it was you know it's modeled after the Department of Justice uh, recommendations and what went into effect in a consent decree in the state of Pennsylvania in 2007. That program, that compliance program, has been endorsed not only by the Department, uh, I, I guess I can't say endorsed by the Department of Justice, but modeled after their program, and certainly been endorsed by NAMAD, the National Association of Minority Auto Dealers, and AIADA, the, the imported auto dealers. So NADA has proposed a solution, and it's a very simple solution that works but the CFPB doesn't acknowledge that. You know, Bill, on another piece of legislation, or at least talk that's going on in D.C., as you know, is uh, the, the whole situation with recalls and the talk about having even used vehicles, have them forcing dealers to fix them before they're sold. And I'm wondering on NADA's position on that. I've been, uh, it's been kind of interesting to see that NADA doesn't, is fighting or pushing back on that. And I'm wondering why, since it's really the dealer that's in charge, or is that is the connection to the consumer and having the dealer sell a used car with recall issues? I'm just wondering what's well, NAD's Well, I think stance. you said a very key thing, Jeff, <coughs> and you mentioned the consumer. And, you know, NADA and all the dealers in this country, 17,800 of them, and the 16,000 members of NADA have nowhere to go. Our, our, the most important person in the world to us is the consumer. And so what NADA is doing and the, and the recall thing is not saying what, what I heard you say. I think what NADA says is we want the consumers to be safe. It's a question of definition. There are 64 million cars that were recalled last year. Only 6% of those were, were so serious that there were stop drives issued. Now, 
we don't want anyone to be unsafe. So if it's a really, truly safety matter that impair, impairs the, the consumer, we can't have that. There's no room for that. On the other hand, if we were to look at the 64 million recalls, you'd find many examples of little things like a typo on a sun visor or a horn that toots too often or turn signal that blinks on the dash and outside. So I think we need to have a fair definition of what is a safety recall so that we can all be on the same page and we don't cause economic chaos by grounding all these cars that the consumer would not be able to drive, much less trade in. So it's a real, it's a real boondoggle and I think we need to just stay the course and get a better definition of what is a stop sale vehicle. And what would what would NADA like to see as a stop sale? Is it anything that Anything affects that, that affects the safety of the consumer riding in that car, as long as it's a serious matter. Danger. If it's a dangerous vehicle, then we shouldn't be driving it. There's no room. We shouldn't drive it. We shouldn't sell it. Both used and new or uh, just? Any, any vehicle. Okay. How badly are VW dealers going to be hit by this diesel situation? And also, what is NADA's role in protecting dealers who are well, coming to their aid? That's a great question. I wish I knew the answer. I think it's evolving as we sit here. But certainly, let's just take a look. And, and from I don't have Volkswagen, uh, but I do think uh, that Volkswagen needs to face the music. And I think they are. I think they need to be contrite. I think they acknowledge they need to acknowledge their wrongdoing and take and put in places and put in place ways to correct all their mistakes. This cannot go on. And there will be a price to pay for that. They've lost their credibility with the American public, I'm sure, with, the, with this diesel representation. One th and it's going to have an adverse effect on Volkswagen dealers, no question about it. But what I do know about all dealers, Volkswagen dealers in particular, this is a time when they'll show their merit. They are going to be there their lives are on the, on, on the line here with their Volkswagen franchises. They aren't going to walk away from it. They're going to stand there. They're going to repair these cars. They're going to be there for Volkswagen. And more importantly, they're going to be there for their consumers because, once again, if we don't have the consumer on our side, we have absolutely nothing. Well, can I just follow up on that? They're, they're going to be repairing the vehicles. What is the likelihood of a customer not taking that vehicle in for a recall when it means that they're going to be getting... Uh, worse fuel economy and worse performance. It's hard enough to get a consumer to take a car in for a recall when there's a safety issue involved, let alone uh, reducing the performance of the car. I, I agree, and I don't know the answer, Steve, except I do think that as time goes on and we get some guidelines from Volkswagen as to how they're going to uh, compensate people, mm -hmm. what the fix is, when they'll have the parts, that then you'll see the dealers stand up to it and make sure those cars do get repaired and they're going to be very very uh, anxious the dealers are to get those customers back in their showroom they need to reestablish that relationship with those customers bill i've got a question for you sort of following up on steve's question there we were talking about this here in the shop the other day and no one had the right answer if an owner brings their car to volkswagen just say for a tune-up or something mm -hmm. is the dealer obligated to make these recall fixes to the car or can the owner say nah don't yeah, bother with that just question. tune it up well I, I don't know the answer but I don't believe that the dealer can do that I, I think that that would be uh, furthering the fraud and, and the deception that Volkswagen's guilty of. Uh, of fixing it or not fixing it? I think they have to fix it. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if, if I know your car has got a, is in non-compliance and is emitting all these particles into the ozone, how can I not stand behind it and fix it? And I believe dealers will do that. Mm -hmm. dealers, dealers understand the consumer is king. Is there a danger then in those owners, to Steve's point, saying, you know, if I get my car fixed, it's not going to drive as well. So I'll just go to some independent shop. I'm never going back to the dealer. Well, I would hope that they wouldn't do that on the same theory that I would hope that the dealer would do the right thing and repair the car. I think if you own a, a diesel, a Volkswagen diesel, and it's supposed to be a clean air diesel, 
you've bought into the ecological theory that this car is is good for good good for the ozone layers, and we're going to fix it. Mm-hmm. But hey, John, what, it, go, sorry, ahead. go ahead. It, he raises a really great point. And as a lawyer, a, a customer comes in and says, "I want this fixed, but I don't want that recall work done." And a dealer is going to go ahead and do the recall work anyways. I mean, that is a real. Are we talking about Volkswagen? Yeah. Yes. Um, well, I, again, I think this is evolving, but I think when the chips are down, the best answer for Volkswagen and for dealers and for the consumers is credibility. We need to be upfront on all this. We cannot, none of us can go and hide on this. We've got a problem. They've acknowledged it. It's out there. And they say they're going to make the right steps to, to correct the problem. We have to give them the opportunity to do that, and we have to be behind them. You know, one of the issues, too, connected with all this has been all this talk about uh, resale values and that of these vehicles. First, how do you think that it plays out with VW? And then second, overall, just in general, do you think resale value really is an issue anymore? Or is that something that just continues to, to bubble up, but there's really no connection back to it actually occurring within the industry when you have recalls on some of these vehicles? Well, I think that's a great question, Jeff. I think uh, resale values are constantly in motion, as we all know. So right now, if I were a Volkswagen dealer, I wouldn't want to have a yard full of uh, (laughs) used diesels that I can't do anything with. So I think that's temporary. I don't know the duration of it. I don't know whether it's 30 days or 90 days. But things do tend to level off. When we've had oil embargoes and 20% interest rates, we've seen fluctuations in the values of cars based on whether they were gas hogs or fuel efficient. We're going to see, continue to see this. And I think, the, to your point, Steve, the issue of recalls and, the, and, the, and what factor they, they influence uh, uh, values is, again, a short-term deal. I think if you're the consumer and you've bought a new car and, it, and it's one you're going to keep for three or four years, it all evens out over time. If you have to get caught in the middle, uh, I think uh, you know, common sense would tell you, let's wait and see how this works. I wouldn't think anybody would be running out to trade in a Volkswagen diesel today and expecting to get good money. For well, it. and I don't think a VW dealer would want it. No, I don't think any of us like would want it. That would be like somebody <laughs> handing them a stick of plutonium. Sure. <laughs> and, and, you know, that speaks to, to the recall situation generally. I would say to you that, you know, one of the byproducts of 64 million recalls can be if, if we have stopped sales on cars, you know, the result is that you're going to have some cars that can't be sold and somebody's going to pay for that. And our small dealers, you know, they're sitting out there, if I'm a Ford dealer and I take in a Toyota and it's got an open recall, what am I going to do with it? In good conscience, I can't sell it. I need to wait for the part. I need to get it to the Toyota dealer to get it repaired. All that will impede the, the economic flow of used cars getting sold. And, and we certainly, if the consumer isn't going to sell it on his own, that won't be efficient. So we need to recognize that in the whole scheme of what happens when we issue recalls. So you do feel that pricing kind of works itself out, that after the, the problem happens, that down the road, it does work out? I, I think it works out, Jeff. I think it works out because the manufacturer comes up with a fix. Mm. The dealers get it fixed. The consumer sees that it wasn't the end of the world, and the car still functions. You know, I, I have friends that have Volkswagen diesels, and, and they're happy with them. I mean, they're, they're not running out and saying this is a bad car. So I think time is on our side. Bill, let's change topics a little bit. I'm, I'm wondering what you think down the road, what's going to happen with the retail uh, uh, network. As more and more of this car sharing and ride sharing pops up, you know, when you talk to, as I have, people or or companies like uh, Zipcar or Relay Rides, another one, they say every car that gets shared takes away the need for 15 other cars. And these car sharing, ride sharing services are only getting more and more popular. It seems that the impact will be exponential. Have you you given any thought to that? Well, I'm not sure I've got the answer. But I would say to you that, that uh, first of all, 
Uh, last month, we traveled at an 18.4 million car year. And I've only been doing this for about 40 years, and I don't ever remember a number that high. So if there's an impact from Zipcar and all the car sharing things, uh, we don't see it today. Uh, I do see the, the value of a Zipcar, and I think our industry is uh, constantly going through an evolutionary process. Uh, and, and certainly in the metropolitan areas, that makes some sense. I think Ford Motor Company is ahead of the uh, of the rest of the manufacturers with respect to it. They're studying it. I think there's room for it, um, but I also don't see any uh, significant impact on new car sales. Something else may affect uh, new car sales, and I don't, uh, I'm not naive enough to think we're going to run along at 17 or 18 million every year, but uh, the market is, is very stable. Uh, all the economic uh, ind indexes point to another good year for next year. Mm -hmm. And yes, we're going to see some, uh, some consolidation in our industry, some changes, and that's our job to stay up with it. Do you think people someday soon will buy a car online, A to Z, that seems to be the unicorn today, but will that change? Um, I don't know the answer, Steve. Uh, my guess is no. I think it's the second largest purchase we ever make. I think we can, I know the number of trips the potential consumer makes to a dealership has changed. It used to be four and a half times before he bought a car. In the old days, uh, on a Saturday, a family would go to the Ford dealer one Saturday and the Chevy dealer the next year, next week, and so on. I don't see that. It's gone from 4.3 down to 1.3. 1, 1 the reason for that is the internet. The consumer is so much better educated. He has all the information available to him online. When he comes to a dealership, he knows what he's going to buy. And now what we need as dealers is we need somebody that's a real professional that knows that car in and out and can help that consumer get through the buying process as easily and as quickly as possible. And that's, in our case, in our dealerships, that's our goal. Is there a fear that the, the salesperson just becomes a, a order taker in the, that salesperson's mind? I don't have to sell the car to them if they've already selected it with all this online research and shopping? Well, I think there's room for that thought. I don't think it's the case. I think more and more the cars are so complex. I read recently that some uh, auto dealer group hired a bunch of high school kids to help deliver the new car because it was so tacky. The kids understood it and the buyer didn't. And the salesman may not have. And, uh, Quincy, so, Massachusetts. Uh, yeah, so that's not, that's not going to happen. I think the definition of salesman is changing and it's changing for the better. We have professionals. The day of the old guy with the cigar in the corner of his mouth is long gone. These people know what they're doing. It's a great profession, has long-term sustainability. Uh, I think it's a great, great place to be. You know, with that too, how, how far away do you think uh, dealers are from squeezing out the third parties, the auto traders, the true cars? Do you see that day coming? Is that something that uh, the dealers would like to see, to say, hey, we're going to do this now? Well, I, I, again, I don't mean to say I don't know so often, but I do. I don't know. Uh, these, it seems to me that uh, we're all so competitive. Every dealer, you know, I mean, uh, we're a great uh, group, but when the chips are down, I'll do almost anything that's morally and legally possible to sell you a car and not have you go down the street. <laughs> so that leaves the door ajar for people like the true cars to offer a, a service to a dealer who wants to steal the market. I think some of this can be diverted to the manufacturers. I think they can put some restrictions on their dealer agreements that penalize you for selling outside of your trade area, or, or better yet, give you a reward for taking care of your trade area. And that's what's important. You know, we're, I'm in a small town in upstate New York. There's five dealerships in it. We own three of them. I cannot afford to have a consumer say anything bad about us <laughs> because he holds it against all three dealerships in that town. He tells five other people. So I think dealers are very, very aware of that, and I think that they see uh, uh, diminished value in these uh, third-party services. And, and if, if, they work with, if dealers can work with manufacturers, we'll solve that problem. Bill, we're getting down towards the very end here, but 
Uh, what I want to ask you about very quickly is the kind of profitability that there is in dealerships. Most dealerships, I was stunned to learn this, have about a 2% profit margin. We've got people in the car industry saying, hey, everyone's got to merge together because we can't get enough scale to make margins. They make way better margins than you do. Real quick, why even be in the business if you're only going to make a 2% profit margin? Well, first of all, as we said off air, you know, uh, I was poor growing up. So 2.2% is a, is a fair profit. We're selling a large ticket item. We're selling a $30,000 or $40,000 car. So the dealers, are, they have a sustainable profit margin as long as all the other factors remain constant. And of course, that never happens. We have fixed operations. We, we have f and I income, we have body shops, we have used cars, and we have new cars. And this is, a, it's a roller coaster, as you all know. So I think it's a great business to be in. I love it. I wouldn't be anywhere else. So, uh, And with that, that's the perfect note to end this up. Bill Fox, uh, chairman of NADA, thanks so much for coming in today. Thank really you for interesting. Me. Jeff Bennett, Wall Street Journal, Steve Finley, Ward's Dealer Business. Great having thanks, the both of you here, too. It. You make my job easy. Thank <laughs> you. Thanks. I want to thank all of you for having tuned in.